Thank you, Pastor, and thank you all for coming out. And um, we want to remember to pray for those who are hunting today. Plenty of people out in the woods, and we pray for their safety. Also today, Gospel Cabin won't meet. It'll meet next Sunday at 4 <coughs> at the Gospel Cabin, so we'll take note of that. And thank you for the team, for your worship team, for singing to the glory of Jesus, for your desire for Christ, and for Sarah, for your playing the special music, and we thank God for that. <clears throat> your desire for God is an encouragement to one's soul. We want to pray Today is the Lord's table, a celebration thereof. We want to lead us from the word to the table. We must understand that what we used to know even 10 or 15 years ago as church in the West has dramatically changed. Not only has, has um, socialism surged ahead in the culture at large, but it is also, in very insidious ways, surged ahead within the visible church. Its reduction of truths and its lies have affected much. Such that, please understand that in the days ahead, more and more will be required of us in terms of word and prayer. What the church needs is a revival. And uh, pray hard. Churches are g gathering together and they hope to have them en masse praying for awakening. We must pray in the days ahead especially. And let's ask God to take this word and to put it into our hearts so that by the Spirit we might live the truth and delight in Jesus who is the King of Glory. Let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we ask for your Spirit to minister to our spirits this day so that we might know that we are the children of God. Father, by the Holy Spirit, would you take this word and would you drive it into our souls that we might come even after this day to a greater love for Jesus than we had before. Let us, Lord, be willing to give up so that you might be lifted up. Let us be willing, Lord, this day to be agents of truth in a world that is spinning wildly out of control. Let us be agents of truth and balance, agents who can be trusted in this world of confusion. So straighten out my humble words, O Lord, and use them to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there are many in the picture of the continent of America and picture on Sunday morning each light or dot of light coming up on the map representing a church in North America. Now picture that in your mind. You have this map of North America and you have these pins of light on Sunday mornings, different time zones, but lighting up as, as the services advance across the country. Picture that, the map with a bunch of lights all over it. And... <clears throat> Know also that many who occupy seats or pews or uh, pillows, depending upon how nouveau you are, those who occupy places in the visible church in the West, where all these pins of light are located, many of them are not children of God. They are many who have simply adopted the ways and the language of their family or friends and thereby uh, believe that they are Christians. 
There are many who base their claim of faith upon their baptism. There are some who believe that by doing good works that they will get into heaven. There are many in the visible church, which includes the evangelical, who believe that it is not only intelligent, but that it is holy to agree with the culture. For instance, you have some who will say emphatically, yes, I believe that it is God's will that we be kind and allow uh, men to marry men and women to marry women. And they'll even say it with tears, but very sadly, this is false religion. There are many who believe that sentimental thoughts are holy thoughts. There are many who think that, it, uh, that religion is something that I use to get me through trouble. And all of this is going on in the West and not in small numbers. All of this sad news, these people, poor souls, who claim to be believers and yet are not, who claim to be children of God and yet are not. But the good news is, and we'll find it here today, that there are yet numerous children of God within the visible churches, and we thank the Lord for them. In the first century, the Apostle Paul faced many Jews, no doubt, who said, we are the children of God because of Father Abraham. And uh, Paul said to them, no, you don't get it. You don't get it. Not all ethnic Israel belong to the family of God, he said to them. Not all of ethnic Israel are children of God. And they may have responded with something like this. Well, then the promises of God have failed. And Paul heard that, and he responded with this text. Certainly the promises of God have not failed. What Paul does here in chapter 9, 6 through 13, so if you just mark that off, chapter 9, 6 through 13, what he is saying to his audience then and to us today is this. There are two things, two truths, about the children of God that must be known. In fact, I'm going to raise a question. Who are the children of God? If they are not folks who merely attend church, and there are plenty who do, who attend church and who think, well, I am a child of God. Sadly, as I said before, with all those points of light across the nation, churches meeting, we have, we have more than we need in this town, and, and, uh, and yet... We know that not everybody who sits in a church is a child of God. In fact, many aren't. So who are these children of God? Who are they? Two points, and then we'll come to the table. The first point is this. The children of God are people of promise. Promise. A promise is a declaration that something specified will take place. I promise to be there certain place on Tuesday, and you show up, you fulfill your promise. I promise to give you this next week, and you go at the specified place, hand the item to the individual, you fulfilled your promise. So children of God are people of promise, men and women, boys and girls, of promise. Let's look at the text, but before we do, I want to take you back to Genesis. If you would turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12, I want to walk through some background verses, and then we're going to go through this section in Romans that Paul has, has written by the Holy Spirit. 
Now notice this, Genesis chapter 12. Follow these verses in the Bible with me. These, it would seem that these verses were on the heart of Paul when the Holy Spirit moved him to write this scripture before us today. <clears throat> the Spirit brought these verses to his mind, I believe, verses like these. We know one is quoted uh, from <clears throat> the texts in Genesis. Listen to this, chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, that's Abram who then became Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. Well, there's a promise for you. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and <clears throat> him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went. Now, if you would turn <clears throat> to chapter 15. Here's another verse section. 15 verse 1. After these things, that is, Abram and <clears> the <throat> story of Abram and Lot, and then Abram is blessed by Melchizedek. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said... O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. You see, Abram and Sarai, who would become Sarah, they were old people. And the papa, you know, they were probably thinking, my goodness, how are we going to have children? So he said, I'm childless. And the heir of my host is Eleazar of Damascus. Can you imagine if you're Eleazar of Damascus? <laughs> you think, oh boy, that's... That's how Abram thinks of me, eh? So, and Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be, uh, <clears throat> uh, will be my heir. And no, no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And in verse 6, And he believed the Lord, and it counted to him as righteousness. Now, move on to chapter 16, and I'll just explain it. In chapter 16, Sarah looks at Abraham and says, you know, you're just an old dude, but I have a young servant, and I will give this servant, Hagar, to you, and you will uh, be physical together, and I trust a son will be born. So here's human effort on display. Well, God's promise, where is it? So now let's just, here's Hagar, Abram, and, and, and a child came as a result of that union, Ishmael. Ishmael came as a result of that union. Chapter 17, <clears throat> we read of Isaac's birth, uh, the promise of his birth, and then <clears throat> Isaac... <clears throat> becomes a reality in chapter 21 of Genesis. And uh, in verse 12, which is quoted in our text for today, the Bible says, but God said to Abraham, be not displeased because of the boy, because of your slave woman, whatever Sarah says to you, do so as she tells you, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. God protected Hagar and Ishmael, but... He still said that the promise will come through Isaac. Now these verses, just review them in your mind. The promises given to Abram or Abraham. They're old. You're going to have a son. Well, Abraham believes God. But then you have Sarah's activity and Abraham is complicit, and then you have Hagar given to Abraham, and Ishmael comes as a result of that, but that's not the promise. Uh -uh. God isn't done yet. He gives Isaac uh, <clears throat> to Abraham and Sarah. And this Isaac is the child of promise, not Ishmael, although Hagar and Ishmael are protected uh, by God in this delightful chapter 21. 
Now go back to Romans. With that in mind, listen to what Paul says. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. God's promises never fail. Now listen to what Paul writes and keep the Genesis accounts in mind. For not all who were descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not everybody who is a part of ethnic Israel is a child of God, you see. And not all the children of Abraham because they are his offspring. In fact, Ishmael in in, uh, Galatians 4, Galatians 4, 21 through 31, is pointed to as a picture of, of unbelief. So you have Ishmael, the son of Abraham, is not the child of promise. So who is? But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh, and that would be Ishmael, who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. That is Isaac. Paul's argument is simply this. Look, Abraham's children, look at Ishmael. Look at Isaac. Ishmael was was, uh, born from, uh, you know, Abraham and Hagar, but still, he was a child of Abraham. But yet he's, he's of the flesh. He's not a child of promise. Isaac is. So what Paul is saying to the people who are saying to him, everybody in ethnic Israel is is a child of God. And he's saying, no, even in Abraham's family, Ishmael, born to Abraham, isn't a child of God. Isaac is because he is the child of promise. That is his argument. So you see the Genesis verses and what Paul says here. Isaac was born as a result of the promise of God, not by human effort. It didn't take a human scheme to bring about Isaac. It was the promise of God that brought him about, not human effort. So there's the contrast. I want you to notice also, God never promised that all of ethnic Israel would be saved. He never did. Biological lineage accounts for nothing. God saves. He is in the process of saving in this context. He saved some of them, but he didn't save all of them. And that's Paul's point. Biological lineage accounts for nothing. The line of promise does. God has not forsaken ethnic Israel. He's saving some of them, but he never intended to save them all. I mean, look at what Jesus said to the Pharisees. You are children of your father, who is the devil. So, of course not. And that's Paul's argument. So, God's promises are are still intact. So, remember what the question was. Who are the children of God? The children of God, here's the first point, are children of promise. God's promise. Isaac was born as a result of the promise of God, not by human effort. Do you see that? That's very clear. This promise thing is one of the foundational issues of the gospel. Know it. What is happening in our Western context in the church in America is the gospel has been and is continuing to be changed so that it fits us better. But no, the gospel, according to the word of God, is foundationed upon such truths as promise, not human effort. One way to apply this is to note 
A child of God is one, and you will notice this in your own life. If you know Jesus Christ, and I know that the core group, you people, you people, I don't see everybody's heart, and you don't see mine, God does, but I believe that you people love Jesus. And that in your heart is something wonderful, and it comes from God. And if you know Christ, a child of God is one who grows in the understanding. Now get this. You grow in the understanding that you are a child of promise. That you are linked with the book of Genesis, chapter 12. You are a part of that great promise. The promise made to Abraham involves you, believer. It has been fulfilled and it is being fulfilled. Remember what God said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 20. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen or true to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes up us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. You can say that all the promises are yes in Christ Jesus. All the promises of God, Old Testament new, are yes in Christ and they're for you, believer in Jesus. This is something that we must ponder as the people of God. We are people of promise. Old and New Testament. All the way back to Abraham, yes, you are a part of that promise. Ponder this truth. Pause and think about it. One of the greatest heart, just this heart sinking issues today is that the people of God, the children of God, we camp ourselves near these wonderful truths like promise. And we walk by it every day. People like me, we just walk right by it. Think about going camping and you camp at the Grand Canyon and you wake up in the morning. I don't know how the campgrounds are situated. I'm sure they're not right on the edge. You get up in the morning and you're right, oh my goodness, isn't this nice? You get up and you go and you look and you delight in what God has done. But consider this, observing a person who pulls up, pitches his or her tent, and is more concerned with frying bacon. And while the time this person is present at the Grand Canyon pays no attention to the wonder that God has made and just walks around and complains. Picture the people, I know from people who have been in Cairo that uh, they'll say that many of the residents don't pay any attention to the pyramids anymore. They grew up with them. They're just out there. They're sort of geographical expressions and so what. And may not have even gone to visit them. Christians are very often we're like that. If you're like me, weak, we'll camp near the delightful promises of God and pay little or no attention to them. But I say this day in the name of Jesus, may people like me turn to the Word of God regularly and delight in the truths like this foundational one, promise. Children of God, you're a child of promise. Remember that and be encouraged therein. There's one other truth, then we'll move to the table, and it is this. Okay. So who are these children of God? They are children of promise, but what else? They are children of call, C-A-L-L. -L. Children of promise and children of call. This is the other foundational truth with respect to the gospel. Get it, understand it, delight in it. We said before that call is the creative power of God by which we are brought to faith. It is inward and outward, this call. Creative power of God. Notice verses 10 through 13. And not only so, but also when Rebekah, that 
is Isaac's wife, when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac. Notice the use of the term forefather Isaac. I thought that was reserved for Abraham. No, it's given to Isaac as well. Why? Because he's a child of promise. Now listen to this, verse 11. Though they were not yet born, that is Jacob and Esau, though they were not yet born, born and had done nothing either good or bad notice what Paul is saying um, forget human merit forget good or bad forget all that stuff okay get rid of that so though they were not yet born had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election remember we said what election is it's an act of God before creation in which he Select some to be saved and some not. And the Westerners, we have a hard time with that because we don't, we don't like sovereignty. And he does this on the basis of no foreseen merit. There's no good or bad he's looking at. Oh my goodness, so-and-so is going to be so good. Well, I guess I'll save him. No. It is entirely on the sovereign will of God. Wow. Paul says this stuff. He just, it just rolls off his tongue and onto the page. And he says, though they were not yet born, had done nothing, either good or bad, nothing to do with human merit, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, no merit involved, but because of his call. There. There. Because of call. The call of God. She was told, the older will serve the younger. That's strange. I thought the older son had a primary place in the ancient world. Well, no, in this case, it's the younger. The older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Period. Boy, what heavy words, but they are delightful words. God's promises cannot fail because they are based on his call, and his call is always effective. When God says, come, you're going to come. When he says, stay, you'll stay. Wow. God's favor for Jacob and his disfavor for Esau, and by the way, Hebrews 12, 14 through 17, speaks of the this Esau as a child of unbelief, someone who turned from the promises of God. But God's favor for Jacob and his, his disfavor for Esau was not based on good or bad works. Jacob's inclusion is by call and not works. Jacob's virtue was not the reason for God choosing to use him. God's call came before Jacob was born. Notice that. God's call came before Jacob was born, before he even showed any faith, before he showed anything. God's call was issued. Wow. Now, who understands all this? Boy, it is massive. But we can understand some things, and we can declare them openly. People of God are people of promise, and they're people of call. God's promises cannot fail because they are based on his call, which is always effective. In my day as a young man, when I was wee, and my mom called me, I came, particularly if she had a little, this little touch in her voice. Come, I want to speak to you. What am I going to do, stand there? <laughs> I tried that, it didn't work. Come, and I would come. Yes. God, his calls are effective. All the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. His call rests 
or his promises rest on his call. That's why his promises never fail. Some things we need to know about this passage. Guess what? Here's something else. You have Jacob and Esau. Esau is a child of the flesh. Jacob is a child of God. God called him. Well, it had nothing to do with works. God just called him. He didn't call Esau, but he called uh, Jacob. Now, Esau received many temporal blessings. The Bible tells us that. But conclusively, Hebrews 12, 14 through 17 tells us the heart of Esau. So there you have it. And notice something here. Isaac and Esau are not like. It's a stronger example. Remember, if you go back to Ishmael and Isaac, well, those are two different mothers, same father. Now you have same father, same mother, Esau and Jacob. And Paul still says, promise, call, promise, call. Here's the confidence in this. Here's one way to apply this. When we proclaim the gospel, it is the Father who does the calling, not us. And the faithful presentation of the Word of God is up to God. We present it the best way we know how, trusting in the Holy Spirit, God takes that feeble presentation and uses it to call sinners all over the world every day. It is a father who does the calling through the faithful presentation of the word. Romans 8.30, again, notice. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. Who is the he? God. He's the one who does this calling, this wooing. What's John 6, 44 say? No one comes to the Father unless the Father... That's God. I don't have to do the calling. I just have to be faithful. What confidence. Look at all the unsaved around us. And let us bleed for them. But let us also say to the lost, you must needs come to Christ. You must need seek after God. You must flee to Jesus or you will be lost for eternity. We do have designs on evangelistic Bible studies. I told you about those. We must persist. Do you know in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus calls to. This displays his deity. In Matthew chapter 11, I'm going to read it in a moment, and then we'll come to the table. Oh, may God use our humble efforts to win many. We're out of time. We must come to the table. Let's summarize. Descent and merit are of no account when it comes to salvation. The, the children of God are, are called so because of the promise of God and the call of God. God calls people, not human beings. We don't call ourselves. He calls. It is the Father who does the bidding. Therefore, let us have confidence. Be faithful in the word of God. But let us be out there sharing the gospel. People need to repent of sin and trust in Jesus for forgiveness and eternal life. Let us obey Romans 10, 14. Let us go and do so. So that's the challenge for us today. Pray for opportunities to tell others about Jesus. Tell them about promise and tell them about call and tell them, flee to Jesus. Flee. Has nothing to do with human descent. Has nothing to do with what you own. It has nothing to do with maybe your parents were great Christians or your grandparents. Nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with God. Consider his great promises. Consider his power. Consider the call. Pray for opportunities. 
Today, however, there may be some who have things pressing upon your soul. What sin, to what sin are you chained? Come to Jesus, repent, turn away from sin, and trust him for forgiveness and everlasting life. May that be today. We're going to come to the table of the Lord, and we're going to consider these matters.